Uh, good day. My name is Stuart Matnick uh, from the MIT Sloan School of Management. And it's a pleasure to participate in this digital transformation in East Africa conference. It's unfortunate I'm not able to do it in person this year, but I look forward to continuing the collaboration. I want to address a topic that should be very important to almost all of you here. And that's the issue of the threats of cyber attacks. Cyber attacks are not news, but many people assume that those are primarily a concern of banks and financial institutions. As it turns out, many other organizations, particularly healthcare organizations, as well as other governmental uh, organizations, have been increasingly threats to that and it's caused significant concerns. In the United States, for those who are familiar with it, there was a cyber attack on the change healthcare system, which processes uh, over half of all the prescriptions in the United States between the prescription provider, the pharmacy or the hospital and the insurance companies. And as a result of this continued cyber attack, hospitals have been losing over a hundred million dollars a day because of that. In any case, let me go and introduce my, my uh, presentation uh, screen. Hopefully this will come up now. Okay, hopefully you can see this okay. And so let me go down and raise the issue. Cyber attacks, as I said, are not news in many ways. They've been concerns for at least a decade and actually goes back several decades. So why is it that cyber attacks and continue to increase? In fact, the number of cyber attacks year on year have been increasing. Let me give you some examples of the numbers. Uh, cyber attacks have increased 20% just between 2022 and 2023. And that's not just an issue in the United States or the Western world. For example, in the Middle East, ransomware gang activity increased by over 77%. And by some measures in 2021, cybercrime caused global damages of over $6 trillion. I would expect it to reach over $10 trillion by 2025. So the question I'm gonna to try to address in the next period of, short period of time is what is it that has caused these increases, particularly what caused the increase between 2022 and 2023 and what can be done about it. And from our research here at MIT, we've identified three important reasons involving ransomware attacks, cloud misconfiguration, and exploitation of vendor systems. So I'm gonna to try to briefly explain what these key things are and what we can do about them. First, ransomware. I assume most of you are familiar with the term. You may not necessarily always know exactly what ransomware is and why that term is chosen. Basically, this is where cyber criminals essentially hold your computer hostage. That is two things they do. In the first case, they try to lock up your computer so you no longer can use the keyboard and the mouse. But more importantly, what they do, they go to all the data files you have, which may be important with patient records and invoices and so on. And they scramble those data using cryptographic codes. So although the data is still there, if you will, uh, you cannot use the data, it's been scrambled. And until you pay the ransom, then it turns out you can get the decryption key needed to unscramble your data. So this is an issue that's been going on for quite a while. And of course, companies are concerned about that. And one way to get around this problem of being the data being scrambled and locked up is if you maintain up-to-date and high quality backups of your data, you can restore the data yourself to an event from last night or even a couple of hours ago without having to pay the ransom up. And of course, we expected, many people expected with these improvements in what people have done, that the number of ransom attacks would start to go down. And in fact, they did for a while. But criminals are very, very resourceful. And in fact, criminals did evolve. What I'm gonna to refer to is the type of ransomware in this screen, I'm gonna call ransomware 1.0, but they have advanced what's called ransomware 2.0. They made two changes that made ransomware much more dangerous. First, it turns out that the original ransomware attacks only scrambled your data. They did not actually take the data. The first change they made is before scrambling the data, they make a copy of it and they export it to one of their own servers. This is often referred to as exfiltration of the data. So they tell you if you don't pay the ransom, not only will you not get your data back, but all of this private data will be publicly disclosed. In the case of hospitals, this may be patient records and other very sensitive data. Thus, they've added blackmail 
on top of the ransom issue. And as a result, there's much more data now being stolen and being made available on the dark web. Okay. I don't know how many of you have experienced a ransomware attack. Those of you who have, you may be aware of this. Those who have it, just stay around. You never know what's going to happen next. But then there was a second change. The cyber criminals, there's a limited number of them, and it takes some effort involved in order to set up a ransomware attack, negotiate ransom payments, and so on. And so therefore, and initially, you, it, there was a very limited number of people doing it. But it turns out that cyber criminals now can, rans that can franchise their ransomware. So you do not need to know anything about the technology, at least not much. You can use the malware, which is abbreviation for malicious software, that they've already developed, they will make it available to you in a franchise scheme. There can be many different forms in a franchise. You could purchase the software from them, but more typically, since it needs to be updated and maintained, you can make arrangements to rent it with them or even share the spoils. This is often referred to as ransomware as a service. So you too can get into the ransomware business. And by some estimations, it has an over 500% return on investments. That means there are many, many more cyber criminals conducting many, many more cyber attacks. We'll talk a bit later on what to be done about this. I said there were three key changes that took place in 2023. The next to change, which actually, once again, is an ongoing increase, is the issue of cloud misconfiguration. Just to the benefit of all of us, the term cloud has been used now for a while, but not everybody understands what they mean by that. That is there, is, there is software and data that you use that is not on your computer. It's available over the internet. As people often say, it's out there in the cloud. There are many consumer examples that possibly many of you have used. That's things like Instagram or Facebook or iCloud or Google Drive. These are both either applications or data uh, supplies, if you will, or data so, uh, storages that are not on your computers. They're somewhere over the internet. And therefore, you don't actually know exactly where that data is. And there are many companies that provide these services. Some names you're probably familiar with, such as Amazon, Microsoft, Google, but there are many others often. And of course, increasingly, and I don't know how it is in your own organization, but increasingly businesses are using these services. In fact, estimates are that over 60% of all corporate data, and this includes hospitals and, and often many municipalities and corporate data, are now being stored on these uh, Google uh, type uh, services, these, these uh, cloud services. And there are many good reasons. I won't go through all of them, but just they're often easier to operate. You don't have to maintain and, and have storage and space for a data center. They can be very economical since often you only pay for what you use. They're very easy to scale. So if you need more for new facilities or additional storage or capacity for an event taking place, let's say for this conference here, you can quickly add it in and then send it away, if you will. And they can be very, very much easier to use because there's lots of application provided. And finally, it's fashionable. It's the thing to do. So many people, of course, do it. Okay. Now, I use the term cloud misconfiguration. What am I talking about there? Well, think for a moment about your own computer or your own smartphone. There are lots of settings you have on your phone. In the case of your smartphone, you can have the ringer turned on or off. You can have the hotspot hot spot facility turned on or off. You can have Wi-Fi on. You can specify which one of a number of networks to connect to the, over the Wi-Fi. There are many different settings that you have on your smartphone. Well, when you start dealing with uh, cloud services, there's not like dozens or hundreds of settings. There can be thousands of different settings for all kinds of options such as who can access what data and what circumstances. And of course, many of these settings, much like on your smartphone, much like on your uh, office or home computer, many of these settings are set by default. These collection of settings we call the configuration, or in this case, the cloud configuration. But if you're not careful, you can end up with a misconfiguration. For example, you may not realize that by default, certain or all of your data files are being made publicly available over the internet. Now that sounds like a silly thing to happen, but once again, if you've got a thousand different settings to pay attention to and set and reset, you may be a reason why you made it publicly available deliberately, then forgot to reset it afterward. So as a result, it's very, very common to find that people have settings on their cloud data that they do not realize. 
and criminals can make use of these misconfigurations or these settings that you didn't realize you had to get into your system. And of course, this is an important issue. Uh, in, in 2023, it's been reported that about 39% of businesses had a cloud of data breach due to their cloud environment. And 80% of data breaches involve data stored in the cloud. This includes many companies you're familiar with, such as Microsoft, Facebook, Toyota, and many, many more. The National Security Agency in the United States, in one of their reports, the quote is, cloud misconfigurations are the most prevalent form of cloud vulnerability. You might say, well, why does this happen so often? Well, I like to say one important reason, the old phrase, haste makes waste. Often we have a drive to deploy new technology. You know, think about all the efforts and activities going on with AI or generative AI, but a lot of these new technologies are not fully tested or fully understood. We have many examples of this. I'll go back to 2007, which is quite a few years ago, to a big hack that took place at TJAC, which is a large uh, department store chain in the United States. They were one of the new adopters to Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi wasn't around for hundreds of years. It's only been around for about 20 years or so. And they were one of the first adopters of Wi-Fi, in this case, in the retail space. And they knew a lot of benefits they gained for it, but they didn't realize, in fact, that there were certain misconfigurations they could do with the Wi-Fi that would allow criminals to get in. And that, in fact, was what happened. So new features and increased complexity, which keeps changing by the cloud providers, provide a opportunity or an or, or opportunity for you to make a mistake that the bad guys can take advantage of. Finally, the third of the things I'm gonna talk about, we call vendor exploitation. I sometimes call it you know, uh, side door attacks. Think about it for a moment. We all use vendors, whether it be in our corporations or even in our homes. For example, you may have someone that comes into your house once a week, once a month to do cleaning, to polish the floors and so on. And of course in companies, you've got people come in who clean the offices, empty the waste baskets, maintain the air conditioning, all the various services that you have. And of course, if you're building a, a device like a car, there are components that, you know, the car has an engine in it, the engine has many components within the engine, et cetera, et cetera. So there are many components you put into your product. And finally, the same thing is true with software. You write some software within your own company, but more and more the software that you use to run your business is acquired from other people. They may be utilities like accounting software, maybe basic software like the operating system or the word processing system that you use on your computer. Now, in order for vendors, whether it be physical vendors like office cleaners or software vendors who have to update the accounting software, they need to have special access to do their job. Occasionally, you'll get a message, they'll say from Microsoft, from Apple, that we will be updating your software tonight. So sometimes they'll give you a notice. Sometimes they'll just tell you, we did it last night, just so you know. Sometimes they just do it and don't even bother telling you about it. We refer to these cases as the automatic updates that occur to your software. So although companies have done a lot of work increasing the security, what I'll call the front door, the hackers often exploit the vendors. Often these are small companies who may be developing accounting software or a patient record systems or whatever else may be, and take advantage of the fact that these vendors have a special way to get in. We call that the side door. And the one, once they get in and take control of that vendor, they can then go in through that side door. As this diagram kind of illustrates, you see the front door depicted here with guards guarding the front door with all kinds of firewalls and protection mechanisms and passwords and so on. But then there's these side dolls, doors which are, which are set up only to be a, uh, accessed through certain vendors. But if the malware shown on the far left-hand side gets into the vendor, they can make use of that side door pass key, if you will, to get into your system, bypassing the front door, and then can take it. And don't forget, a given vendor doesn't have just one customer. It may have hundreds or even thousands, or in some cases, hundreds of thousands of people. So therefore, every client of that vendor can be attacked. I don't know whether it's happened to you, but in the United States, there have been a number of massive attacks of this form. Some referred to as with cryptic names somewhat, like Log4J or SolarWinds or MoveIt. I'll just take the MoveIt one that took place just about a year ago. But that hack 
In other words, the vendor of movement was attacked. And then the criminals then took advantage of the side doors that movement had access to, to get into companies. So far, there's been over 2,600 companies and organizations have acknowledged that they were victims of the movement attack. We don't know the actual numbers because many people choose not to reveal the fact that they suffered a cyber attack. But just in the 2,600 companies that we know were attacked, over 80 million people's information was exposed. So those are the things that we have to deal with, those three issues. What can be done? I just want to say a few things about things get done that maybe things you should do with your own organization and maybe help other organizations to do. The first thing is education. To many people we've come across are not aware of these attacks and exactly how they're done and what can be done about it to prevent them. So you need to get the word out. You need to say, well, gee whiz, do you check your vendors? Do you know how secure your vendors are? There's now an increasing emphasis on having vendors be validated to know they are doing the right things to protecting your pass keys, if you will. It's the things that just check the security vendors. And there are certain rating services such as BitSight and Security Card Card. And then you may want to limit the per permissions of your vendors. Maybe you give a pass key, but the pass key is only in the case of the air conditioning maintenance people, the pass key may only be to the room where the, maintenance, where the air conditioning equipment is stored, not a pass key that gives them access to the entire building. Secondly, in all these cases involves stealing your data one way or another. We should watch for any kind of suspicious exfiltrations. This is often not done. In the case of the TGX attack I mentioned earlier, the department store, it turns out billions of bytes of data were being sent from the main data center in the United States to servers in Latvia, in Europe. As it turned out, G TJX had no customers and no vendors and none of their employees based in Latvia. Why were billions of bytes of data being sent here? The answer was, that's where the criminals wanted to put it. So you need to be sure you understand where is your data going and you need to be able to discover that attacks are going on when the data is being taken out of your system and sent to strange places sooner and faster and stop it. That helps all three cases. I want to mention to once again, the average cyber attack, according to various reports and studies have been done, is going on for over 200 days before it's discovered. And discovery is often only done by a third party, not by you. So if your data is, in, and for the last thing, if your data was kept encrypted, you, you, you have encryption keys and, you, and any data you're, you're not currently working on is stored in encrypted form. Even the criminals steal the data, they can't do anything with it because it's cryptographically encoded. So these are some of the many things you can do. We're glad to talk to you more about other things, but these are kind of the highlights. If you find these topics of interest to you, there are many things you can read to get deeper into them. There are a number of articles we have uh, come up with in the last few months, uh, as shown here, both in the Wall Street Journal and the Harvard Business Review. And we have a fairly detailed report that we came up with in, in December, a few months ago, that's available on the screen here. So these are just some of the places. If you need these email addresses or these web addresses, I'll be glad to send you. If you have any more questions, you can, I'm looking forward to hearing from you. My email address is smadnick at mit.edu. As I said, it's unfortunate I'm not here to be with you in person and to interact with you and, and answer any questions you might have at this time. But I look forward to hearing from you and answering questions at that time. Thank you very much. I want to wish you all well and hope you enjoy this conference. Thank you.